Hi, I'm Mara Webster within Creative Company, and thank you so much for joining us for one of our talks. I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic John Hoffman, who is the co-creator and showrunner of Hulu's Only Murders in the Building. And I wanted to start by actually talking about the character of Mabel and how she relates to you, because part of the genesis of this show is that Steve Martin had come up with the idea of the title and a little bit of a concept of, of what might happen in a building and the investigation of murders. And then you actually had a really personal experience as it relates to what the show has ended up being in that you had a friend who had unfortunately passed away and people thought it was a suicide and, and similar to Mabel, to you it just didn't seem right and the pieces didn't fit together and so you started talking to friends and to family members and then it actually turned out that there was more to that story. And so when it came to creating the show and, and writing the scripts and particularly with shaping Mabel, I was really interested in how that infiltrated into a lot of details and her experiences as a character. That's such a great question. And and yes, very personal. Um, and, it, and I'm happy to have that be the case because I think the show works hopefully on a lot of levels for people. Um, and, and one of the things that was sort of my own personal discovery through this writing process with Steve and with our writer's room and everyone was sort of how you can't not acknowledge the truth under true crime. And um, in my uh, experience, right before writing, yes, it was within the year uh, before uh, Dan Fogelman and Jess Rosenthal said, come meet Steve Martin to do this, you know, fun half hour comedy. And I was like, oh, okay, well, it's, what is it about? And all of that sort of thing. But I had never been in any situation quite like what I'd been in with sort of this, my head being sort of turned on its ear um, over the emotional sort of side of it, uh, of, of a mystery being presented to me in my life, like the one that was presented with my friend um, uh, who, uh, would, yes, I, I didn't, I had been out of touch with him, like Mabel is with Tim Kono for 10 years. Um, there's a lot you don't know, so that when you find out terrible news, that's impossible not to avoid, it's impossible to avoid um, not asking certain questions of like, how did he end up here? And, and none of how he ended up makes sense to me. That was exactly what I was going through with my friend. Um, and uh, I've never felt so compelled to know an answer to anything in my life um, as I was to understand the person I knew back then. And in, in the case of my friend, there were two people. It was him and another person. They were found dead. And the initial look at it was and by the injuries, it, it appeared that my friend had killed someone and then killed himself. And that was the thing that was so unsettling to me. And I thought, I know this person. This was someone I grew up with and was like a brother to me. So in my gut, I felt I don't, I can't put that together. And in pursuing that and learning about his life and learning about his family, much like Mabel, sort of like, not the family side in the story, but, you know, in the exploration and the utter, you know, drive to investigate. Mm -hmm. um, I met his ex-wife, I met his kids at the age they that he was when I met him. So it felt like I was walking in and seeing him. So that scene where she sits down in episode two and talks to Tim, um, it almost felt like that I was in a life that I just needed to know answers. What have I missed? What has led to this? What connects to me? to this story and there were connections for me to that story as well. So all of it is tied into Mabel's investigation in a certain way. But then by the end of uh, the time I was spending getting to know what happened, the police report came out a year later after my friend died and it was actually the reverse and that he had actually been murdered. And so my, my feeling, my gut feeling about it was right. And that was a very awful, <laughs> Uh, victory to have in my head, but it was there was a some resolve that felt more peaceful than the way it was presented at the beginning, and that's a Mabel story here um, that I found just found its way inextricably into the writing because of the personal experience I'd been through. 
And be because of that understanding of, of the emotional undercurrent of the narrative that you're telling through these characters, was it always clear to you what you wanted the stylistic approach in how you told this story to be? Because it is a comedy, it's super fast paced, there's a lot of great one liners. And at the same moment, you still always allow us to revisit those moments. Like if we look at the character of Oscar, who's been away for 10 years when he comes out, there's that moment where he something like him talking about not having had ice cream on the beach for 10 years. And you managed to play the emotion of that beat into a comedic moment. And so was it always clear to you how you wanted to approach marrying those two different sides of what the show needed to be? It's a beautiful question. I, I think it's come up a lot, the tones. And I got very excited by this idea of this mashup that we could do that felt very, um, I call the tone of this show New York, because um, it's like you walk 10 blocks in New York and you get like five different tonal shifts that happen. Um, you know, you can be dazzled by some gorgeous art piece of architecture next to some modern monstrosity or something. Then you're laughing hysterically at something you see, or then you are intrigued or scared by some other interaction. And then there's a Broadway show doing a promotion in the middle of the street. Um, and, and it's getting brassy all of a sudden, you know, it's all constant. So knowing that we had Steve and Marty, it was always going to be a comedy and knowing that it was, um, my own experience with a mystery in my life was going to be a part of this as well, knowing that it was set in New York and all of those things came together in this mashup. And it got me more excited actually, because I thought, oh, I haven't seen anything like that. And that just naturally made me think, well, let's try it. Let's go for that. And then I also wanted to talk about the development of the characters as we see them on screen, both individually, but really about the, these three characters as, as a collective trio in so many moments, because, you know, they have this shared history and yet they don't have a shared history at the same time. They're actually spending time with one another for the first time. You know, even Martin Short and Steve Martin's characters have known of each other and kind of seen each other in the hallway, but they've never actually stopped to have a conversation. And so when you're developing and shaping these characters, does it kind of allow for this version of, developing who these characters are and then almost a redevelopment as the season continues because you have that idea of who they present themselves to be at the beginning when they're choosing which side they want to allow outside of themselves and then you get the actual real layers underneath as they become more comfortable and trust each other more. Absolutely right. I think, um, you know, looking at, there was a lot of factoring into that, you know, knowing that we would have this intergenerational story with three people that really don't make sense on paper. Marty and Steve, of course, do, but put them with Selena Gomez and I'm leaning in, but I'm also worried. And, and then like, how is that going to make any sense? On the other hand, that was the magic of it was that we were sort of like having this moment where all of us on set realized, Oh, look at them work. Like it was instantaneous. And there was just something so right about what we were feeling about the intergenerational sort of comedy that could come from that, but also the pathos. And, and so knowing Steve and Marty as not just brilliant comedic, you know, pairing, um, that they were great actors on their own and um, that they were uh, looking to, you know, deep uh, for me i got excited by the idea of deepening who they were in their screen life um and i wasn't sure whether they'd go for it uh as much as they did but they were so you know it's interesting to catch them at this moment in their life too i think you know they've got such great life experience but also they're so talented but i find them so winning and then the way in which to watch selena get brought into that mix um as the characters themselves though, uh, I think, you know, that was also really intriguing to me and knowing it was an ongoing series that, that the peeling back of the onion layers of each of those characters um, needed to be judiciously stepped out. I like any part of, I mean, I think the, the really interesting mix here in the show, as you say, it's very well paced, which I'm happy to hear and I hope it is, but it also wants to sort of take its moments and slowly let, let the thing un, un, unveil and reveal itself. Um, so it's a combination. 
And with the visual aspects of the way that the story is told, it's not just coming down to, okay, this is where we're going to put the camera. This is the framing. We're going to have a dolly shot here. There's elements that were very clearly written into the script. Like there's the moment where we suddenly see a slow motion of each of the three characters where they have an object in their hands that drops to the ground and then bounces back up. Or we're breaking the fourth wall to go into a theater audition for who's going to be the suspect of being the murderer. And so in, in both working with Jamie Babbitt, who directed the first two and the last two episodes, but particularly in setting that up at the beginning with what the, the visual style was going to be, um, what was that collaboration with her, but also the ways in which in writing the scripts you, you were already thinking about a lot of those visual aspects and how that would fit into the style of the series. It's such a, and I love your questions, Mara. Thank you so much. The, um, uh, it's great to get a chance to talk about this because I, I spent many years um, working as a screenwriter, working in, in television just only more recently in the last decade or so, but many, many years as a screenwriter. And I assumed it's a visual medium. And so I would write visually for uh, my screenplays and, and and really I love to swim in that world and like envisioning it laying it down and letting someone try and envision it too but unfortunately a lot of times in screenwriting you get people who are reading them who are like moving into the dialogue area and I feel like some of that got lost so this was an opportunity where I could sort of live in my visual expansiveness in my mind for many years of the screenwriting and actually try and execute some of the ideas that come from the inner core of these characters and let them. And I was amazed because Dan Fogelman, Jess Rosenthal, our studio Hulu all said, yes, we want that to be a part of it. And I'm like, you're kidding. Let's try it. Okay. Let's see how that works. That was thrilling. Jamie Babbitt, um, you know, I think any director and, and she's a dear friend and we'd worked together on looking prior to this. Um, and we had a good understanding. So carrying these things off elegantly, carrying them off, you know, and again, it's not just visual um, exploration of, of, you know, what's going on internally with a character. It can be a visual joke. It can be, you know, the loneliness of going down from window to window at the beginning as they're all listening to their podcast. Um, those stories tell so much and they convey so much when without any words. And that part of me is, um, that, that is, I do feel like just, um, you know, an essential part of the show, but something that personally just makes me feel very gratified that, that we got to do those things and it became a part of the language of the show. Um, and it, I, I love that it's there. And then jumping into talking about the true crime podcast element of the show, which is obviously a huge part of, of how the story comes together with these characters. It's so interesting to look at the narrative structure in comparison to podcasts, because when you listen to a lot of these podcasts, there is that intentional MacGuffin tactic of, OK, you know, we don't want to reveal our hand. We don't want to tell you who the killer ended up being until the end, because it's about telling you a story. It's about narratively taking you on these different roads and really discovering the gray area and, you know, yes, this person might not be the killer, but we're going to explore them and, and talk about some of the elements of them anyway. But what you've done with this series is you've taken that idea and almost reversed it because these characters genuinely think all these things are true. They genuinely think Sting is the killer when they think he's the killer, for example. <laughs> um, and so was, was there like a real journey of looking at the narrative structure and how a lot of these podcasts are shaped and then how you wanted that to land with these characters who have no experience in that, but think they have such an idea idea of it. Yeah, it's a good idea, isn't it? I love the idea so much, but I found out quickly I screwed myself because it's super hard to write. Um, because in, of course, the podcast world, you're going into a real situation. You're, you know, doing documentary style journalism. And then you step back with all the information you've gotten and you can puzzle it together and present it in the way you want. And that's thrilling. And yes, it's structurally and stylistically what we're doing with every episode. But it is very different when you have to create the actual story instead of come and hear. Now, now it's almost like it's it's the difference. I think of um, you know having a table full of like twenty photographs. That it's just about the way you arrange those photographs and tell them in the most interesting way to hold your last photo for the big reveal, and and you set them up like that. But here you're literally looking at you know twenty photographs that don't have any images. And, and so you have to create the images that twist your way there. 
it's quite the comedy to write. And I can't tip my hat enough to my brilliant writer's room and to Dan Fogelman and Jess and Steve. Uh, everyone was all in on this and in and, and shaping it. And, and But the, it was another thrill sort of like to talk to Steve about this because Steve had this original idea and I sort of sat with him and talked to him about sort of the podcasting side of it and that our trio would be podcasting as they went along with the investigating. Um, and that's a funny idea, but it's also, it, it called out for the structure that we created, which was built around sort of a podcasting structure that I love, um, but it's also to invent it for each season is, is quite challenging. And in terms of writing characters, once you know the cast members that are, are playing them, is there a difference in moments where you're writing to the grain of what audiences expect from someone? You know, we expect th this type of comedy from Steve Martin. We expect it from Martin Short. But then you bring Sting in as a character who literally kicks a dog in the elevator <laughs> out of the way. And that goes completely against the grain of what audiences are expecting. And so that's why that's funny. And so how do you approach the, both of those different types of writings for particular people? That's a perfect way to put it. Knowing that Marty and Steve uh, would be in the show ongoing and knowing the way they breathe a certain humor between them um, and knowing my own lexicon growing up and knowing everything they've ever done uh, has been filled with the way in which they've talked or have I've interpreted the way they talk. So my big crux moment in writing this was delivering the first script and hoping that Marty and Steve would not just feel a connection and a vibe, and that feels like me, I'm, I can do that. And that feels like our rhythm, which they both felt. But also behind that was also to say, is this too much like that? Do you, is it, is it me just mimicking back to you? Um, and, and they were so generous and immediately like, oh my, I, I, I just know the character, I know how to play it, I know. And they sunk right in without any hesitation, which was fantastic. On the other hand, with Sting, um, and and those moments, yeah, how can you flip it? How can you play with that? With with guest stars coming in who have a different sort of um, persona and how to make little poking jokes and fun of it. He was so game. And on that elevator scene, that moment where he's talking about I don't like dogs, that was a line. But uh, then he extended, it was, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of improv with the show, truthfully, it was, it was kind of amazing that way, but he did improv the line about, um, uh, I think he said, I have a dog. Uh, and Marty asked him, do, do you have a dog? He said, I have a dog. I don't like him either. Um, and that was, that was all sting. So he was game to be sort of like, not fond of dogs enough to potentially be a poisoner. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I appreciated that, but I like any of it. Yeah, any anytime we can play off of what you expect people to say if you know them well um, and go the other way. When you step back as well, there's so many characters that get introduced into this story and yet they all serve such a strong narrative purpose. You know, Tina Fey coming in as someone with a podcast empire that then pops up in multiple episodes or obviously Amy Ryan coming in and that entire arc that she has with Steve Martin. But then even the moment where Jabuki shows up and he's just one of the podcast fans outside, but then suddenly he's inside helping to solve the crime because him and his friends know a lot of the details. What What's your process of really making sure that when you are writing characters like that, that may only be in a scene or two for one episode or popping up in you know, sporadic scenes across different episodes, that it really makes sure that they are always there and they are, are always serving the narrative purpose, but also that they each have their own really, really distinct characteristics in the way that they do in this show. As we went along in the writer's room for season one, um, it became clear to me once we started shifting perspectives through I, first the, narrated, the, the podcast narration and each episode sort of having a different perspective, it became clear that, oh, I stepped back from what we were doing and I thought, oh, we're doing characters of New York. So we are, you know, and what Mabel does throughout the course of uh, the season, she's putting a mural on her wall of the windows and the characters of the building. And I, New York is a place filled with indelible characters. And so I think that was another part of it, this sort of ultimate wish for the show is that while you're doing a murder mystery, while you're doing a comedy, um, you're sort of creating a tapestry of New York and New York characters. So um, really helping us to focus each of these episodes was, 
entering in with a voice uh, that feels distinctive from what we might expect, but it gives you another take on the thing. The, the key thing that had to happen was that that voice and that person had to connect in some way to some aspect of the story. So in episode five, which aired just over the weekend, we have um, these guys who pick uh, Lucian and, and Vaughn who pick up um, uh, Oliver and Charles at the gas station when their car is exploding. <laughs> um, and they, you know, of course they're the horticulture homies um, and they've got a podcast that has over 60,000 subscribers. And so that kind of thing is just touching on what, what is going on for them. It gives a new perspective on like, we are nothing with this. We are, we are nowhere with this podcast. Um, and then you might see how those sort of culture homies also pass the baton in episode six, uh, right up at the top, because um, I don't want to say too much as a spoiler of this. I don't know when this is airing, but there is a mention of the horticulture homies uh, and their own podcast uh, connecting to why we're at uh, where we're at at the very beginning of episode six. And then lastly, I wanted to ask you about one of your other writing endeavors. You were talking about some of your previous experience, but you've also been a writer for the Oscars, um, I think in 2009 and, and just last year in 2020. And I think it's such an interesting project to get to work on because it's such a, a continuation where it's a living, breathing document. I imagine that script because you have the idea that everybody comes up with thinking about what do we want the show to be this year? You know, what's the story that we want to tell within the show? And then as segments start coming together, as some things work, as some things land, as some things come away, there's a continuous evolution. And then you get to that stage where you have an idea of what the host aspect might be if there is a host, um, what the inter sections are going to be if there is no host and then you start having presenters and having to figure out as people get confirmed you know trying to write specific things to them as well so i imagine it's a living breathing document almost right up until the moment that the show actually happens and so just wanted to ask about a lot of the journey of, of how you approach that and the really unique aspect of working on something like that again a very well-informed smart question um and only particular to that because it's um i had never worked in any uh award show world as a writer. I got invited in 2009 to um, write uh, Bill Condon, my dear friend produced that uh, Oscars that season with Larry Mark. Uh, and and I, it, I, I wanna say it's my favorite of, and I was so lucky to work on it, but I, it was genuinely, if I step back, my favorite of the last many, many years. And I was given this crazy assignment by Bill which was to take, it was the year that they first had all past winners uh, come forward in their categories, the acting categories, to give special honor to every nominee directly. And I was given the task of writing all 20 of those for all the acting categories. And so it was a rare situation for working on an award show. That was all I was in charge of. I got a few other assignments later, but. That was quite something because I'm now talking and having conversations with 20 of the most famous people in the world and talking about what they would like to say about someone else. And, and that was fantastic. But along the way, you got the process of working on one of those shows, which was incredible. The head writer of that is John Max. He was a good friend of mine as well. And he uh, I worked on it again later because John said, come back and do it again a couple of years ago. And um, that was a different experience because it wasn't a centralized sort of around one task. Um, but it was, uh, that was more of the global experience you're talking about, which is that living, breathing document that lives up until the moment it happens. And in this situation, you've also got the world of presenters coming in and one presenter mixing with someone else who's fantastic, but one presenter would like to say this and one presenter would like to say this and sometimes that doesn't match up. And you're like, oh God, okay, how do we, how do we make everybody happy and how do we find our way here to say what we want to say? It, it's one of the most exciting things in the world to work on because it's happening live and it's going to billions of people live. Very few things do. And you really are feeling that first night opening night energy if you come from the theater uh, and you have that energy you don't usually have anymore in filmed or television. Um, certainly that makes you feel like every word out of people's mouths will be heard by more people than you could imagine. And, and in this moment, and hopefully it all comes off well. So it's a thrill to work on that show. Um, and I can't believe I have because I had, had no aspirations to. 
Well, thank you so, so much for sharing all of this and huge congratulations on the season two pickup of Only Murders. Uh, very excited for that news and, and to see what you come up with yeah. for the next season. We're, we're deep in it and excited to get it out there too. Yeah, it'll be very exciting. Thank you so much. Lovely talking to you. Lovely questions. Thank you so much.